This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. And aloha. Welcome to another edition of uh, Hawaii in Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. For those of you who may not see in the program, uh, here we talk about a lot of things that deal with the veterans and military uh, community, and also the inner um, the interaction between the military and the civilian community. We have a lot of veterans over here, or once they get out, they um, try to give back. That seems to be the spirit of uh, most of our men and women who are serving. Today, it's my pleasure to have a very distinguished member of our community, Mr. Glenn Martinez, who is um, a former Marine and also uh, currently with the uh, Coast Guard. Glenn, welcome. May I call you Glenn? Oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your military background. I know okay. you're a Marine, served yeah. in Vietnam. Yeah, I was a Vietnam uh, vet, uh, 68 to 70, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I volunteered for the draft, and at the induction center in Florida, I volunteered for the Marine Corps. Yeah. So I went to Paris Island, did that, and uh, uh, got up to Quantico, Virginia, and requested to go to Vietnam as a combat photographer, because mm -hmm. I to been going to a two-year vocational college to mm -hmm. become a photographer, yeah. and I wanted to be a Life Magazine, National geographic -y kind of guy, mm -hmm. and uh, I noticed that all these big magazines, most of the su successful photographers were actually World War II correspondents. Sure, yeah. They were a lot of the famous guys, and they went on to Life Magazine, National Geographic, and they had a kind of a, a, a club of old-timers. Yeah. And so I went to Vietnam. I had a great time. I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a combat photographer, I wanted to be in the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. and I went from unit to unit uh, photographing them. Yeah. And uh, got to do a lot of neat programs in the Fleet Hometown Release where you go up to a young Marine and you say, what's your name, what's your rank, what do you do, and what is your hometown newspaper? Yeah. And I would roll that up, put it in a bag, and 72 hours later, that would be published in that young Marine's hometown newspaper. Yeah. Nobody else knows this kid, right? He's, yeah. he's an 18, 19-year-old kid. But in his hometown, there he was, and the result was he would get mail from the hometown, cookies, et cetera. Yeah. And so it was a really good, feel-good campaign, mm -hmm. you know, for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in between uh, mortars waking you up at night or going out on patrol. But, you know, if you're doing a job that you really want to go, I mean, you, 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 sometimes not politically to correct to yeah. say I had a great time at war. Yeah. But I'm sure General Patton did. I mean, sometimes you're, you're born to doing it. And I felt like that was it. Yeah. And uh, I came back from that and uh, went into wedding photography and I found that more hazardous than Vietnam. <laughs> and, uh, but then I became an electrician here in Hawaii, 23 yeah. years with Glens Electric, yeah. and uh, did that. Then I bought a fishing charter boat and became a merchant marine captain. Mm -hmm. And uh, along the way of it, I got with the Coast Guard Auxiliary, started back in 1976 with them. Yeah. And, are, you, uh, are, you the, are you the auxiliary commander? Or? I'm the flotilla commander for okay. Kaneohe Bay. Mm -hmm. And so we have about 53 members in our flotilla. Um, we used to be one of the most active flotillas teaching more people than anybody else mm -hmm. on boating safety and that. And it's, it's really had good results. 20 years of doing three times a year a public education class mm -hmm. at Windward Community College or Kalaha High School, yeah. the number of incidents has shrunk as people become more educated. They carry the proper equipment on their boat. They learn what the little red and black markers are coming in and out of right. the ocean. Mm -hmm. We're having less calls on them such that we used to do rescues every week, mm -hmm. and now we're hard put to do one a year. Yeah. So, uh, and that was, the good news is the public education worked. <laughs> so it's a great organization. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I want to uh, just to backtrack a little bit, you know, as far as with the, um, your experiences in Vietnam, I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you about, is there anything, any particular story or incident that happened with an individual or a group that stands out most in your, you know, in your memory? Uh, to me, it was the uh, the corpsmen that had done second tours. Uh, you learned to hang around guys that were on their second tour. Yeah. And the kind of a unique thing in Vietnam is we all knew we would only do 13 months and you would go home. Mm -hmm. And you only had to go once. Nobody, that, to my knowledge, was made to go twice. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you did your 13 months and you got you got out, mm -hmm. uh, I was coming up to, I did less than 13 months because I was coming up to my discharge date. Yeah. They could have extended me. You know, I was there and doing fine and everything, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't. They didn't force people to do that. Now, come over here to Iraq and Afghanistan and that, I've got young Marines uh, yeah. visiting my farm 
on their third and fourth tour. Yeah. So they know they're going back. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this war has been going on 16 years, you know. Yeah. And so my generation, we never had to go back again. Mm -hmm. If you survived one trip, you were done. Yeah, that's one yeah. of the problems that we see, you know, of course, with the multiple deployments and everything else, some of the mm -hmm. um, other things that develop, the PTSD, of course, which mm -hmm. is going to happen if you've been out there long enough. Uh, of course, the suicide rates, things of that nature oh, yeah. that are not really, they address it mm -hmm. when it's in the press, but when it falls by the wayside, mm -hmm. you know, there's still a lot of things that, you know, fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. You know, we do talk, here on the program, I do talk about what's going on with the VA, and mm -hmm. uh, there are some issues systemically yeah. that need to be corrected, but there's something you brought up that we were talking about offline as far as the CHOICE program, and I oh, know you wanted to yeah. relay that to the uh, audience. Yeah, we've done, uh, Tulsi Gabbard has done great things for us with the VA. She's mm -hmm. been a great champion for us. And one of the programs that uh, she championed and others did was the First Choice program. Mm -hmm. And that was so that uh, veterans of any service that are mm -hmm. qualified to go to Tripler to mm -hmm. get medical care, yeah. if they live on Molokai, Maui, or Big Island, there's a plane ticket yeah. involved, right? Mm -hmm. And sure, you get free medical care if you can get to the front door. Mm -hmm. And they, were, uh, they championed this program called First Choice, and it means that they can go to a local doctor, particularly for the routine things in life. Yeah. You know, everything from flu shots to you have to get a physical or whatever you're doing on, and you go see the, a local eye doctor instead mm -hmm. of coming all the way over here, mm -hmm. you know, in the hotel rooms and everything else. It starts to add up quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I live over in Waimanalo here on Oahu. Mm -hmm. That mountain in between the Koalaos qualifies as a geographical Fair. barrier to mm -hmm. me getting a tripler, mm -hmm. and it allows me to go over to Castle Hospital or Waimanalo Health Center. Yeah. Again, for the more routine things or I had troubles with my knees back mm -hmm. from jumping out of a helicopter uh, that, that wasn't as close to the ground as I thought it was, you know, and uh, I impacted my knees yeah. and a lifelong problem with it. They referred me to a local civilian uh, physical therapist, mm -hmm. and in two weeks, he had me back and up and gainful again. Yeah. And uh, I teased him. I thought there were some of the silliest <laughs> exercises I've ever done in my life, lean mm -hmm. up against a ball on the wall and do squats and kind of silly. Yeah. And it was amazing he got the dexterity. Mm -hmm. And it has now been two years and not reoccurred. Right. So, so many times in medical, you get something that just gets you through the night or gets you through the week, yeah. but you still have the underlying problem. I was able to get referred out to some real first-class civilian doctors yeah. that are dealing with this. So it's been great. All right. Yeah. Like I say, there's like system, systemically a lot of things, of course, mm -hmm. need to be addressed. But again, we have to recognize, and one thing I do say about here on the program is that even with the systemic problems, you do have a lot of people in place who do the best that they can mm -hmm. with what they have to work with. Right. And one of the things as far as with the people who are not related to the military is to make sure that our um, elected officials, mm -hmm. you know, uphold the promises that were right. made to our military, you know, active and right. veterans, yeah. to make sure, you know. So yeah. the, the active duty people need to know, like say, that the public is behind them. You That's know, right. you may not always agree with the policies, That's but it's right. the soldiers, you know, and sailors and yeah. Marines that's out there, yeah. you know. And like when we have a local representative, Tulsi Gabbard, who mm -hmm. goes to the federal, who served in National Guard, who went to Iraq, mm -hmm. who who had boots on the ground. Yeah. That's a totally different uh, level of compassion and energy yeah. as opposed to other people yeah. that, that have never served in the military. And, um, you know, you wonder if they have any empathy for what we've been through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well some of the policies that it seemed like when we have certain cuts within the government, they, it seems where they want to go ahead and gravitate towards the veterans or, you know, mm -hmm. the military to make certain cuts, you know, that we, you know, we know are essential, but right. for some reason it doesn't translate, you know, in the halls of Congress and, you know, some other places. Right. But um, you mentioned, uh, let's, we're going to go ahead and transgress, I'll, I'll make a transfer, I mean, uh, segue. Segway. I'm, okay, yeah. I'm trying to find the right yeah, word. I've always you know. wanted to get a segue. <laughs> yeah. I can't spell yeah, yeah. it, but anyhow. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that with the operation that you run at their uh, Olamana Farms, uh -huh. okay, I know with that, you've uh, been doing that for quite some time. Yep. You're an educator, you're an inventor. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things that you have in place that have been implemented right. around the world. But tell us a little bit about just about that. And mm -hmm. also, you know, to want to hit the good mm -hmm. points and also I know some of the obstacles that you mm -hmm. run into, you know, in trying to get certain things in place. Right. Well, one of the programs is a national program. Mm -hmm. And I used to be president of the Hawaii uh, National 
uh, United Farmers Union, mm -hmm. and um, did that for about two and a half, three years, mm -hmm. and we championed a program called Vets to Farms, mm -hmm. and that was for returning vets mm -hmm. to come back and get to go out to a farm. Yeah. And some of the programs are, I've done Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and, uh, and Air Force people, and when they're down to only six months left in their enlistment, and let's say they're back here, they are allowed their programs in the military that let them go out and cross train to a civilian world. Mm -hmm. And so they would come out to my farm from eight in the morning till noon yeah. and train with this so that the day they got discharged, they had uh, something to go and do. Right. Because if you're a machine gunner, it mm -hmm. just isn't a lot of call for it out there, you know? No. Or a tank operator, you know? Mm -hmm. Can you get them into a backhoe? Mm -hmm. And so what we try to do is, if a guy was a tank operator or a motor pool guy, mm -hmm. is get them on equipment, backhoes and, and bulldozers and yeah. sort of thing. Um, one, one thing I like very much about when you're working with the ex-military people or former military, is they tend to be mission orientated. Mm -hmm. They need to focus on something. Yeah. And uh, so when you get them onto a farm where they can live and work mm -hmm. and get off the daily pressures of commuting to work, yeah. having to have transportation to get to work, mm -hmm. worrying about the meals and the whole juggling, laundry, all of that. Right. When they get to come to a farm and live there and get room and board, and train four hours a day, then they're free till eight o'clock the next morning. Yeah. They can do a special project or that. And uh, it's good. And so we segued from that into working with the returning veterans that uh, have got different emotional problems and yeah. medical problems, and they need a calm down period, you might yeah. say. And so they will come out to the farm normally for three months. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny, if somebody can have three months of less stress, mm -hmm. doing something that's entertaining uh, and educational, learning about the farming, learning about growing organic food, it's a different conversation in their life. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we don't allow sea stories. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like if we're dealing with an inmate that's mm -hmm. got out of prison, yeah. we don't tell prison stories. Yeah. If he came back from Iraq, we do not talk about Iraq. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we can talk about fishing or anything else, mm -hmm. but but not that area right. you know, to dwell in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know that um, I visited your farm. Lisa got a mm -hmm. great operation out there. Mm -hmm. And of course, we talked offline. We mm -hmm. known each other for a while, yeah. anyhow. But I know that there are some things that you try to put into place that you try to introduce to certain of our representatives or elected officials. Mm -hmm. And the response has not been as all that enthusiastic as it possibly mm -hmm. it should. I believe it should be. You know, mm -hmm. uh, is there any changes or anything coming up in their attitudes or something that the public uh -huh. can do to? you know, help, you know, promote the programs that you're doing? Uh, it's kind of most of the solutions, mm -hmm. and I consider myself a solutionist. Okay. That is a person that if, if you started telling me a problem you have, mm -hmm. my mind would start right away thinking about solutions, right, yeah. right? And I'd almost stop and say, well, did you try this? Did you try that? Mm -hmm. And what you find out sometimes when somebody's telling you their troubles, mm -hmm. they're not actually looking for a solution. They just want you to listen. listen yeah. And what we're finding out so much is the government really doesn't want a solution. Mm -hmm. They just want us to listen and then look the other way while they throw money, money, money at it. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, the right house, uh, the, I think it's uh, the, the uh, housing complex out here mm -hmm. uh, in Kalihi. Mm -hmm. The headline's in the paper. They're going to spend a billion dollars to remodel this high-rise building. And you're reading the article, and it says there's 342 apartments. Mm -hmm. now, 342 affordable housing apartments. That's pretty nice. Yeah. But go and divide that. Divide $1 billion by 342, yeah. and it comes down to $2.7 million. And you got to ask yourself, what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why don't we just give all the homeless people $100,000 and a plane ticket, you know? Yeah. I tell you, while we contemplate that, we're yeah. going to go ahead and take a short break and okay. let the audience, you know, right. work on some kind of formulation for what you just mentioned. Right. And we'll take it from there. But uh, we'll be back in just a moment here on uh, Hawaii in Uniform. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history, Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. 
Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Okay, welcome back to uh, Military in Uniform. I mean, Hawaii in Uniform, I keep getting the name of my own program screwed up here. Anyhow, before we took the break, uh, you mentioned about, um, you know, certain solutions, you know. Yeah. And that's the one thing that I think a lot of people confuse about, where people within the community, I mean, I've interviewed right. individuals who are more than willing to go ahead and donate their time, monies, and everything else, mm -hmm with a very cost-effective solution to some of the programs or problems we have, like homeless and all these different things. And again, it's just like, where's the common sense? You know, it's costing us all types of money. You mentioned before we took the break about this housing, the, the money that they the want. The mirror right housing. Yeah. So two and a half million per unit? Or? Yeah. Uh, I mean, every time you look at, say, like a Sand Island, they built yeah. a homeless shelter over there using mats and containers, mm -hmm. right? And you built 11 little containers for people to live in and, you yeah. know, set it up. And then you see the dollar figure. And let's say it says they spent a million and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. And me, I have to take that million and a half dollars and divide it by 11 and yeah. go, really? You spent $150,000 for a massing container for somebody to live yeah. in? I mean, we can do better than that. Now, on the other hand, I was out in Waianae, and I saw some of the small houses they're providing for some of the homeless families out there. Mm -hmm. Very nice little units, mm -hmm. and they have a long term. They're not just going to be rotated out from them. It's right, a yeah. new way of life. Mm -hmm. um, we have a young member of our family, my extended family, Hawaiian family, mm -hmm. uh, that just got housing in a plantation housing, brand new housing mm -hmm. uh, out in um, uh, by Wahiwa mm -hmm. out there. And uh, it's a fantastic program, and they pay like $400 a month rent and yeah. their own utilities, uh -huh. but they get a three-bedroom, two-bath house, a new house, yeah. as long as they're an agricultural worker. And that's where you come down to, if you're going to be an agricultural worker, or you're going to go into farming mm -hmm. like that, to be able to have housing, to have a real home, yeah. you know, a modern construction home, mm -hmm. For four hundred dollars a month, yeah. you can see where that will be a shot in the arm. Yeah, and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, because it seems to be uh, again when you look at the news, it seems like they're raising our taxes all the time for yeah. all these boondoggle operations right. and stuff like that. And when you know, like I said, it just doesn't make any sense what's going on. Like right. saying, I, you know, people get very frustrated. You know, mm -hmm. when they say you break it down to what it's going to cost. Or, you know, like. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is who's making the money? That's one of the mm -hmm. dirty little secrets that they don't discuss in public over exactly. here. Exactly. You know? And even in the tourists, we do, I champion ag tourism. Mm -hmm. And Olamana Gardens was a, a flagship uh, place. Basically, uh, we get thrown under the bus every now and then mm -hmm. for promoting ag tourism. Mm -hmm. And the Big Island used my farm as their uh, model mm -hmm. of how to do ag tourism, in that we have school groups come out and tour, you know, for $10 a student. Mm -hmm. They come out from 9 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon. They eat lunch at our farm. They bring mm -hmm. their own. and But they tour a five-acre organic farm. We yep. have, you know, three horses, you know, uh, you know, six goats, 200 chickens and ducks, mm -hmm. and they do a hands-on project. Mm -hmm. Well, it's educational. Well, then we had, we've had 28 different countries come to my farm and stay three months or longer. Yeah. We had like five men come from Rota. USDA paid for them. They came, stayed at our farm for three months, learned all about aquaponics. Mm -hmm. Now, when you live and work right on site yeah. and you do something six to eight hours a day mm -hmm. and you don't have all the distractions of driving to and from work or going back to a hotel and going out and drinking or whatever else, but you sell contained onto a farm mm -hmm. and you concentrate on something, it's amazing what people absorb in three months. Yeah, and so it's been a really good program. Mm -hmm. I think, <clears throat> I think uh, for the younger generation, mm -hmm. not everybody's built to be a uh, tech tycoon or whatever yep, it is. Yep. You know, some people just want to get back to the basics, you know. Right. And if you give them the opportunity, you right. know, to for a program, right. you know, like you have, right. you know, I think it's more, it's, yeah. More is being done for the community right. and for the individuals, and it also sets the example yeah. as far as what can be done when you, you know, you put your mind to it. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. 
Um, I know that also that you travel around, you and your mm -hmm. partner, uh, Natalie. Yep. She uh, travels with, I mean, yeah. you guys go around the world. Um, I know that you mentioned before you're an inventor. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things I know that you yeah. invented that you just turned over to the public and let them, you know, benefit from that, you know. There's not that many people that I'm aware of who are so selfless where they're willing to go ahead and share what they're doing. But I know the, right. you know, where you're yeah. coming from, you set a great right. example, you know, for yeah. community spirit in this right. Well, a lot of what we've done is um, for the public at large, okay, in that we travel to the Philippines, Korea, China, uh, we went to Jamaica last year. We're going back here in about two weeks. We're going back to Jamaica. Um, we got in calls to go back to San Juan, Puerto Rico. We put in an aquaponic system there. They got totally wiped out with the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And so you go back and help people put it back together, yep. you know, rapidly. And uh, so we're troubleshooters kind mm -hmm. of thing. So we come in. And, and it can be very heartwarming. Um, I love with the Coast Guard Auxiliary. I became a certified instructor with the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. So I started learning how to teach public courses. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being a lecturer for University of Hawaii. They mm -hmm. sent uh, Natalie and I down to uh, American Samoa and West Samoa. They sent us to the Philippines. And it's, it's nice to be an ambassador of your country mm -hmm. and of the educational system. Yeah. And uh, I don't have my PhD. I, I have my NCW. And I, I worked for about four and a half years before somebody asked me what the NCW was. And I said, it's no credentials whatsoever. <laughs> I, I just simply do it. Right, yeah. And so what Olamana Gardens became is mm. we do less and less of the PowerPoint presentation and more yeah. and more get a shovel or a hoe or a pick. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the, one of the attributes we have with Olamana Gardens is and we, we specialize in doing aquaponics where you raise fish in a tank and mm -hmm. you pump the water through the vegetable. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when they think farming, they think a hoe or pick or a shovel and out in the sun right. and a hard, tough life. Mm -hmm. But aquaponics is a bit different. You're inside of a greenhouse most of the time. You're in a protected environment mm -hmm. um, in port. And so they, uh, they call it CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And for kids that show up dressed nicely and in clean clothes and white tennis shoes, they can do aquaponics mm -hmm. because it's a very clean environment. All the beds are raised up waist level high and that you don't have the stoop labor mentality. Mm -hmm. But one of the really cool things is it brings in technology because they're doing their Arduinos, they're doing computer control systems, mm -hmm. They don't want to walk around and do the clipboard, write down the temperature, the pH, the oxygen. Right, yeah. Pretty soon they learn to do a raspberry pie and bring it back out to you know the computer mm -hmm. and monitor it on a computer mm -hmm. such that I can pull up my phone, hit my phone, and I can show you my fish tanks from anywhere in the world. Yeah. As long as I have cell service, I can look at my fish tank and see that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, seeing a video of them swimming around yeah. is more important to me than all the scientific instruments saying pH, water temperature, yeah. you know, oxygenation, right. you know, pictures, a thousand words. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's good fun. Okay. One of the things that, um, you know, Urban survival. We see what happened yeah. in Puerto Rico, you know, and around lately with the weather systems and everything else. We know that, well, they tell us, well, we have a seven day period for food right. or whatever it is. I don't know, I don't quite understand why there's not more emphasis placed on programs because with, you, with the aquaponics and some of the other technologies mm -hmm. is available, you don't need a large operation, you know, to grow food or whatever, you know. Bingo. You can do your own thing, you know, on a right. smaller scale, you know, and then when the time comes, if there is an emergency, for those who don't have or can't, you know, are not in a position to help themselves, right. um, it it makes it easier when you're more self-sustainable for a period of That's time. Right. You know, to help um, right, right. with the situation. It's kind of funny we, when we have a, a disaster situation like mm -hmm. what you have in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and mm -hmm. that going on, and normal life is disrupted. Yeah. Well, we we fly in MREs, we fly in bottled water, and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And what we're promoting is fly in seeds. Yeah. Send them seeds. In three weeks, they'll have their own food. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to get back to it. Uh, I think one of my favorite stories is Havana. Mm -hmm. uh, when they went through the missile crisis yeah. and America embargoed them and no ship that went to Cuba was allowed to come to America for mm -hmm. the next six months. Yeah. So that pretty much just starved Cuba out. Mm -hmm. and, and they call it their special time. Mm -hmm. The average person lost 25 pounds in Cuba, mm -hmm. okay? And they yeah. were not known for being large people to begin right. with, yeah. right? 
Well, what happened is the Australians went over. They're a neutral country, mm -hmm. and they went over and they promoted permaculture and organic farming. Mm -hmm. And now Cuba raises 85% of what Cuba eats, mm -hmm. and they export. Here in Hawaii, we import 85% of what we eat, mm -hmm. all right? And what we do export, it might look like food, like coffee. It sounds like a food. Mm -hmm. But you know, coffee has no calories. It's not even a food. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and then macadamia nuts. Yeah, it's edible certainly, but it's not a meal. Yeah. Sugar cane certainly it's a basis of food thing, but you don't live on sugar. Yeah. You know, except my teenage kids that uh, seem to do okay mm -hmm. on sugar. But the the point being is that so much of our crop that we do grow in Hawaii, the coffee, the macadamia nut, even the fish down in Kona, we grow in the offshore nets. Yeah. 95% of all of those things are shipped out of state. You know, how much coffee can you drink, how much pineapple? Yeah. But here's the absurdity of the situation, that a child in our Hawaii school system, the public school system, will virtually never eat a pineapple at lunch that was grown in Hawaii. Yeah. Can't afford it. They will be served imported pineapple mm -hmm. from foreign countries, because yeah. it's cheaper. It's all about the money. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, and you talk to the people that run the school program, they say, we got a dollar 47, we got a dollar 87. Yeah. You don't serve organic food on dollar 87, you mm -hmm. serve pizzas, mm -hmm. okay? And then we get into the absurdity of our life. We know we have a problem with obese kids in school. Right. You know, we have a problem with obesity in America, period. Right. But definitely our children. I remember back in my generation, President Kennedy with his physical fitness, and he started touting every kid mm -hmm. would do, you know, two days or three days a week of PE in school. Yep. They get physical exercise was deemed to be important, mm -hmm. right? Now you fast forward up to now, I have our federal government comes out to the schools mm -hmm. and tells them because they're getting federal subsidies that they have must serve 1,500 calories at lunch. Right. Okay. This is very interesting. We need to continue the conversation. Yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, sometime in yeah. the future that uh, people will be able to yeah. view you on your yeah. program anyhow. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. I'm sorry, we don't have much more time anyhow. But yeah. I want to thank you for, you know, joining us yeah. and for your community service. And I think we're, like, we're about 30 seconds. Do you have any information you want to put out, contact information? One thing I want to throw out is the we have the convention coming up for okay. the Hawaii uh, Farmers United. Mm -hmm. uh, it's coming up here October the 7th, okay. uh, real close. Mm -hmm. It's going to be one day at the college, at Leeward Community College, okay. and then they're going to be on farms for two days. Okay. Just go up and check that information out, and I think you'll find that interesting. Good. Glenn, yeah. thanks for coming on the program. Sure. Looking forward to seeing you more in the public yeah. eye anyhow. But I want to thank everybody for viewing the program. Check us out on uh, YouTube and a few other avenues out there. But thanks again, and uh, God bless, and until that time. Thanks.